I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a working person with a full-time job, respectfully, that wants to and drives to have my art feed my family. Friends, family, followers, welcome. You're listening to Doc This 24 and 12, the series where we're interviewing 24 amazing artists, filmmakers, content creators, and business players and bringing the best of those interviews to you. This week, we have filmmaker, painter, animator, and all-around gifted creator, Dana Sink. You know, to be accepted into the film community by your peers and people that are part of the industry is perhaps the the, the best part of the whole experience. Dana is no stranger to recognition and success. In 1999, he created a short film that aired on MTV and quickly made him aware of his potential in this work. It was definitely a, uh, naturally it was a big confidence builder. Uh, The process itself was, we actually mailed a physical VHS tape. It was 1999. They put out for a call for entries. We ended up mailing our entry in and they loved it. They left me a voicemail on my home phone. However, he knows how to keep his dreams in perspective. As a family first artist, he knows that his greatest work is being a father first and finding the right windows in his life for his passion. My full-time job at the end of the day is genuinely, you know, being a member of my family. And my animation is a product of my desire to communicate, tell stories, and create. And the, the animations are a product, if you will, of every free moment that I have. With input on his perspective of the art-life balance, his eye for the art, and inspiration on knowing what's important, I'm happy to bring to you all Dana Sink. The best place to start is just a little bit of history on kind of what inspired you to get into this work and what you are doing today. Um, Thanks, Barry, for having me on the show today. I really appreciate it. My name's Dana Sink. I'm a uh, filmmaker, animator, painter with the majority of my focus in past few years, I would say, really heavily focused on my animation. I guess one of the things that really kind of got me into exploring this this area was uh, my initial interest in making films. And I was concerned about finding actors, so I ended up making a bunch of puppets. I figured I could act my own film out. Well, long story made short, I was honored to have, have the opportunity to have my short film air on MTV several times. From there, I continued to make short films there. And I, I kind of toggled back and forth between painting and making short films. And after my wife was after we, we had our first daughter and during the pregnancy, I didn't want to have my wife around any of the, the chemicals that I was working with. So I decided to really explore animation. And from there, just kind of, I found this uh, new voice, a new way to express myself and uh, just something new to explore. That MTV piece, that, that must have been, did you have any formal history? I mean, it sounds like he, maybe you did some schooling, but it, how did that come about? I had a uh, studio and I was painting at the time and I had a bunch of scraps of canvas laying around and I ended up sewing the pieces together to form the puppets and they were kind of pretty complex puppets. And I ended up painting them with acrylic paint, paint that I had around the studio. And my original idea was, was that I was physically going to act out all the parts. Well, all my friends coincidentally were in the film program at the time and were more interested in acting in front of the camera with the puppets than they were really interested in helping me film. So my friend had a VHS camcorder. He was kind enough to film it and we paid someone to sneak into an editing studio and edit it out and and we ended up submitting it and it aired on MTV several times. How does that process go? I mean, do they, do they call you and how, and how long ago was that? And, and for your confidence, what was it like to kind of have that experience? It was definitely a, uh, naturally it was a big confidence builder. Uh, the process itself was, we actually mailed a physical VHS tape. It was 1999. I didn't even really know what a film festival was. They put out for a call, a call for entries. We ended up mailing our entry in and they loved it. They left me a voicemail on my home phone. And uh, coincidentally, I'm still not sure why, but the the girl I was dating at the time (laughs) listened to my voicemails. And then she ended up calling my mom up and telling her there was a voicemail from MTV. It was a good time. Very good experience for me. I'm fascinated by that. And uh, fascinated probably because that doesn't happen often. And yet at some level, there's a lot of us out there that would love to have something happen to their work. 
what came after that experience? I mean, was did it change your work at all? I mean, what was the evolution or were you just like, oh, that was great and then move, moved on? I had a lot more people interested in helping me out <laughs> at the time, which was pretty cool. And we ended up producing a few more short films with the puppets, mainly for ourselves at the time. We, you know, like I said, we, I really wasn't even aware of uh, film festivals or, or stuff like that at the time. So that was great. And, and then from there, I continued to make short films. Had some things air on like MSNBC. It was a um, it was a short film at the time. This kind of a not to get overly political. Or at the time, it was like an anti-Bush PSA type thing. <laughs> but uh, that got really good feedback, and they showed that on MSNBC. But I definitely think you know the, the Vimeo the the Vimeo staff picks have in many respects uh, gotten me more coverage and and you know to be accepted into the the film community by your peers. And people that are part of the industry is perhaps, for me personally, the most has been the the, the best part of the whole experience. Definitely. Speaking of Vimeo, I mean, that, that's really where I started to gain some awareness of your work with the, the looping graphics that slowly speed up into a larger overall motion piece. Can you talk to me a little bit about where does a piece like that come from? Hmm. You know, it's, it's. I'm interested in a couple different things. I'm I'm interested in uh, space and just how objects lie in a space on a on a specific plane. But I'm also interested in everything being constantly part of a bigger picture. I don't want to sound overly existential or anything like that, but ultimately how something small adds up into something bigger and, and more specific. It is fascinating for me because again, I'm a, I'm a probably more documentary guy, but I, but I work with graphics people all the time. They have a completely different mindset, a completely different mind frame for this stuff. And I'm always fascinated to kind of hear their process. And for me, you know, and that kind of leads me to what bigger questions that I love to ask. What's the thing that drives you, has driven you over the years to do this work? I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a working person with a full-time job, respectfully, that wants to and drives to have my art feed my family as much as possible, right? But I'm also, my full-time job at the end of the day is genuinely, you know, being a member of my family. And my animation is a product of my desire to communicate, tell stories and create. And the the animations are a product, if you will, of every free moment that I have in my life. And that's another thing that that really kind of pushed me towards doing animation is that, you know, I, I have this burning desire to be creative and tell these stories, but I also have this burning desire to be with my family and support my family and love my family. So it's become really critical for me to figure out a way to merge the two. And sometimes that involves me sitting in a doctor's office, getting some animation done on my device while my daughter's waiting to be seen, or maybe I'm taking my daughter to dance class and I'm literally sitting there in the the room waiting for my daughter and still being productive in my work. And I think that was another thing that really drove me to uh, exploring animation in this medium is the ability to be compact, mobile, and produce something that is, you know, fairly epic at times, you know, in my small sense of the word epic. Man, that is, I, I can't relate more. And the challenge for me is on the waking hours, keeping my focusing my mind to where I'm not obsessing about it and I'm still enjoying my family when I'm with them and I'm not doing it. Curious, how do you manage that? How do you turn it off and turn it on and and, and satiate that passion and and keep balance with with all uh, all the other things that you have? I have an extremely supportive wife and family, and the, I, I have to be emphatic about that fact. And I think that that with my art is what happens. It's it's um it's almost something that kind of when I when I start a new project and I'm I'm right now right at the edge of the beginning of a new project and it's something that kind of starts off slow, if you will. Not overly slow, but it begins to build momentum and then eventually becomes like a freight train, if you will. And I think that the relationship that I have with my wife and family, I think that they've kind of gotten a pulse on when the freight train is moving. But that said, you know, I, 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 
I still stay in the game. I'm still taking the garbage out. I'm taking care of my daughter. You know what I mean? So I, it, it's, and, and to your point, yeah, it does become challenging at times to, to turn it off and on. And, and, and I think that, that to be able to do that successfully and do it the way it needs to be done, there needs to be this, this unspoken understanding. So a couple other questions. I don't want to keep you all night. Is there a favorite part of this work for you? You know, I am a get to the top of Mount Everest and plant my flag kind of guy. So I, I do love, love, love the process, but I am also, I do love the, the final product. I think just the, the reward of completion and that completion, there's nothing better than that completion rush for me personally. Would you be able to define or give a word to your style of work or who you are as an artist? Yeah, I like that. I would say that my artwork is not ego driven. I'm not creating work with an award as the goal. I think that as soon as you have a counter intention other than putting out the best possible piece of art that you're capable of putting out at the time, if you have any other intention other than that at that time, the work automatically becomes tainted, you know? So I definitely, I definitely think that I would consider my work non-ego driven. You know, when you have the successes that come with your work and, and the kind of accolades or the, the pats on the back, how do you how do you keep your ego in check? It took about thirty four years for my full frontal lobe to develop. No, but uh, you know, I, I think I think we you know we we were all young at one time. We've all done silly things, and you know, there's like the decisions I make today may be different than the decisions I made yesterday, just because of the twenty four hours I experienced. You know, after that, does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I think that the best art is the art that you create solely for yourself. And that's not to say that you can't create 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 art for yourself and be part of somebody else's vision, per se. It's just staying true to yourself, keeping your core in the center. You know, what I'm getting from that create for yourself is, yeah, that's really powerful if you kind of break that down and think about it. Because it it sounds up front, it sounds like a selfish thing, but I think what... What you're saying is you art is a learning process about yourself. It's an expansion of your own learning of yourself at some level. And what you're saying is don't allow a vision of of what the world is going to, how they're going to perceive you or how they're going to accept you or maybe even the, the awards and accolades of it affect or drive it because you've got to be, be more vulnerable, more willing to be criticized and not let that bother you because it's not about that. It's about you telling the story to as true as it is, as you can tell it. So, so I guess that's how I would interpret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting. I think that, that, yeah, I think that, that that's even what, you know, the ball series is about the ball series. I've been working on it for four years. And I think that it's a representation of where I'm at at that point in time. It's kind of like my own personal time. That ball traveling through those spaces is my own personal timeline of where I'm at in my life and what I'm thinking about on all levels. I think that's also why just creatively with with some of my work and my animations, I put the title at the end of the animation is because I feel as though when you put a title at the beginning of a film, which is fine and fantastic, and I've done it myself, but when you put that title at the beginning of a film, the viewer is kind of watching the entire film through the screen of that title. Do you see what I'm saying? Part of me, you know, I, I feel as though the title should support, naturally it should support what the film is and what the film is about, but it shouldn't necessarily be the first focus for the film. Yeah, I like that. I, I really do. I really do. I feel like I could go down this road and now I'm going to have to go back and revisit every one of your pieces and kind of <laughs> try to, in a lighthearted fashion, see it and go, oh, wow. So yeah, that's kind of his passage. That's kind of his journey. Yeah. I mean, e even from being from a painting background, when you're in a gallery, what do you do? You're 30 feet away from the painting. You see the painting, right? Then what do you do? You get three feet away from the painting and then you see the title and the title is kind of like the, the exclamation point for the piece you were just looking at. No, that's cool. It's making me rethink some of my titles. So yeah, one, la one last thing. If you were to pass on, you know, one thing, if you were to pass on one thing to uh, someone who, who a a looks up to you, follows your work, or uh, one of your children, uh, grandchildren even, if you were to pick one thing about your work, what would that be and why? I would say if there's probably anything 
is live for today and think about tomorrow and understand the relationships of everything and how everything is connected. You know, I kind of believe in the, the whole butterfly effect theory is just, you know, the, the, the flap of a butterfly wing to suddenly changing the course of so many different things across uh, life and, and nature. And with that, I think that uh, be nice to people makes everyone's life easier and carry forward what you would do differently. Right. I mean, ultimately, and that 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 includes our art as well. You know, every project that, that you do, you know, everybody, I'm sure, takes a step back and says, ah, I wish I would have done this or I could have done this differently. And, you know, that's the best part of everything. Friends, family, followers, did you learn something from this interview? Did you get something new from it? If so, comment below. And if you have someone you'd love to hear advice from, leave a remark and I will look them up. Until next time, keep doing the work to keep the dream alive.